John Thorburn, and I'm really pleased today to be the worship leader. An opportunity that you too can sign up for for the board that's in the Mountain Lounge, as well as other things like greeters and making treats. And uh, don't forget that. I had to mention that now because I might have forgotten it. So we welcome everyone here to worship at Ralph Connor Memorial United Church at the Rundle campus. Now whether you're from Minnithini or Banff or Canmore or elsewhere in the Bow Valley or somewhere else in the world, like Guatemala, <laughs> we'd ask you to stand up and introduce yourself so we can get to know you afterwards at coffee time. So are there guests here today who would like to introduce yes, themselves?
Sicilia. We gather this morning in the shadow of Sacred Buffalo Guardian Mountain and name with appreciation of the traditional stewards of this land. The Stony Nakoda people, Chiniki, Bears Paw and Good Stony, the Satina people, the peoples of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Kani Kanai and Siksika, and peoples beyond Treaty 7, including the Métis Nation of Alberta District 3, and the peoples west of the mountains who have been in relationship with other peoples for a long time. We pray that we will regard these lands as sacred in the way that they have, and that our desire for reconciliation will be deep and real. The rainbow pillar on the communion table signifies our understanding that when we gather in Christ's name, his welcome is wide. Our hope is to be a safe and welcoming place, open to learn from and be changed by all who come here, including people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. May we fully live into our desire to be people of a love that knows no limits. Please join with me in the response of opening prayer. The words are in your bulletin and will also be rejected. You have called us to set this sacred time apart, O oh God, to rest in your presence and to give thanks for your, all your goodness and loving kindness. From the Spirit of God, power over our lives, make us into your church, make us impatient to embrace the vision of peace, love, and justice. Restore in us hope as the morning opens out into a fuller day. May the light of your grace fill our hearts, enlighten our minds, and direct the works of our hands in this place and in the world. Amen. This is the time of the service when we take some quiet time um, in preparation for hearing the Gospel reading. And what I'd like us to do is sort of recall those last words of the prayer. May the light of your grace fill our hearts, enlighten our minds, and direct the works of our hands in this place and in the world. We sit with these words now in a quiet time. I invite you to sit comfortably in your pew, and relax your shoulders, to close your eyes if that helps you to be really quiet. And in order to release the distractions that may have come with you today, take three deep cleansing breaths, entering into a quiet time with God. We thank you, O oh God, for providing a dwelling place, a place where we dwell in you and you dwell in us. Amen. Please remain seated as we sing the first two verses of Seek Me First.
not the first time I've opened my book upside down. <laughs> Our scripture reading today is John 14, verses 1 to 14. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples at the Last Supper. And Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, and that you will always be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen me. But Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The word of God for the people of God. Testament, 
the Lord's house or dwelling place is an immensely rich idea. It essentially means the place or places where God's presence is manifest. I'm going to repeat that. The place or places where God's presence is manifest. Often in the Psalms, God's house or dwelling is in the temple in Jerusalem. Other times it refers to the whole creation or even the whole universe. Some Psalms describe God, such as Psalm 90 and 91, as being our dwelling place. That it's God that is our dwelling place. So they conclude the point is, God's house or dwelling place is wherever God's in, wherever God is, wherever God's presence is evident, wherever God's will is done. Jesus assumes this in many of his discourses. The meaning of John 14, 2 then is, there is plenty of room with God. End quote. Now, I must say that I am less certain than the folks at seedbed.com that these words do not also include a heavenly realm as one of the places where God's presence is made evident. Uh, I do believe that those are words of eternal comfort that Jesus is saying. <clears throat> but having said that, I am enthousi enthusiastically underlined their main point, and that is God's house is wherever God is and wherever God's will is done. God makes room for anyone that wants to be in that kind of place. A place where God's love is abundant and overflowing. A place where we dwell in God and God dwells in us. Just like all that Jesus was saying about being in the Father and the Father in Him. So this house and dwelling place isn't so much a place as an attitude. Wherever God's powerful and transformative love is found, we are whole. We find our dwelling place in God as we recognize that God has already claimed us. And we gain a sense of being at home with God as we give ourselves more and more fully to that love and all that it implies. As love, the kind of equitable, just, invitational love that Jesus lived, as that becomes our motivator and our guiding principle, we realize that we already dwell in God, and God dwells in us, and that becomes more real and more powerful the more we do. Now, within today's gospel reading, as we get a bit deeper into it, there are other words that seem perhaps less expansive, less invitational than these first words that invite us to dwell with God, knowing that there's ample room for everything. Amidst this same discourse, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but by me. And that, to me, sounds like it's building a wall but Reverend Mark Davis, a pastor and Greek scholar in California, whose work has helped me time and time again, reminds us, we must place these words in their original setting. As John mentioned when reading the scripture, Jesus was talking to his disciples in the week before his crucifixion, basically the day before, reassuring them that things were going to be okay even when he left them. He assures his friends that that they don't need to go looking for anything other than what they've already learned from him. All the things that they've done with him. As they traveled the countryside, teaching and healing and sowing the seeds of the new king, kingdom or kingdom of God. He's reminding them that they already know the way to God. They already, in essence, dwell with God. They just need to keep on keeping on. Um, elsewhere, other times that I've preached on this, I've, I've gone into some other thoughts on what Jesus was getting at there. But we'll leave it at that for now. That his intent 
was to expand our notion of God and deepen our sense of connectedness to this God, not to narrow our notion of God or set up a bunch of screening criteria of who is eligible and who is ineligible to come up close to the divine. Jesus here makes clear that God's house, the place where God's love is made known, is not a closed door, reservation only logic, designed to house only the most devout Christians. No, all who are drawn to the love of God, all who are drawn to the ways of Jesus, are invited to dwell with God and to have God dwell in them, inspiring them to thoughts, words, and deeds that spread God's love. For those of us in the Christian faith, for those of us that are in that role of being Jesus' present-day disciples, the path to God's house isn't hard to find. We just need to invest our lives into the words and actions of Jesus, many of which are extremely political, built upon a complete inversion of our ways of privilege and greed. We aim our lives in a Godward direction when we do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. As stated earlier, the key point made in these first verses of John 14 is that there is plenty of room with God and the God of my understanding is one who throws the doors open wide. So going back to that verse we started with, in my Father's house are many mansions, we've looked at the ways that this goes far beyond some narrow way of viewing where God is. It's not just about the pearly gates of God. But within these verses, and the verse from 1 Peter, that uh, you will see on the front of your bullet. Come to Jesus Christ. He is the living stone people have rejected, but which God has chosen and highly honored. And now you are living stones being built, uh, being used to build a spiritual house. Within John 14 and in that, there is very specific, very physical language of construction work. And that connection of dwelling with God at an actual place does bear investigation as well. We have now been here in Bank for 15 consecutive Sundays. And I want to give thanks for the ways that this building this physical structure enables the ministry of Jesus Christ to be experienced. It's experienced by those who gather here in worship um, and by all who are helped by the things that happen here. Expressions of tangible assistance in Christ's name are provided through the affordable reused goods made available one floor lower in the thrift shop. The readiness of the manse for the Bati family, the play school that has served generations of Bantfites, and the explicit statements of solidarity expressed to passers-by on Banff Avenue by the rainbow logo on the sign and by the red dress display that was up last week, all expressed a strong connection between the bricks and mortar of this place and the living stone that we are called to be. Once we are able to use our other church home as well, once the accessibility upgrades are complete in Canmore, the ungendered washrooms, the accessibility features, plus our pre-existing uh, visible solidarity with the LGBTQ community and our indigenous hosts on this land will expand our ability to extend Christ's own broad-based welcome in that place. And while I have heard for decades 
um, arguments that, well, the church should just be about ministering to others, not about buildings at all. Well, I gotta say, the reality in town ministry in particular is that a building shaped not just for our needs, but for the greater needs of the community, is a tremendous asset to the community. It is a tremendously important thing for these towns, not just for us. Every single thing we do that makes these two buildings accessible and inclusive, every public action we undertake that creates safe and welcoming space for people of all gender identities and sexual orientations, among others. All these things affirm life in the way that Jesus would have us do. On this Sunday, we consider the dwelling place that we have in God, and we acknowledge the ability that these church buildings have to help us express God's welcoming love. Or, if we choose to express something very different from that. But you know, at the end of the day, even with all the things that we are called to do, even with all the things we already do and are able to do, we also need to remember that this whole process isn't just about us. All of this is made possible. All of this is enabled by the glorious, creative, invitational of the author of life, the author of love, and Christ who is the cornerstone of our lives. As we dwell in God's love, as God's love dwells in us, as we seek tangible ways of sharing God's, uh, Christ's vision of a future kingdom, God's own glory is made known and that is a good and glorious thing indeed. May this be so. Amen. Our next hymn is from Voices United, number 808, on Eagle's Way.
and standing. Please turn to those around you and exchange with them visible signs of the peace of Christ.
mission and ministry. For the next two Sundays, we honor Asian Heritage Month with a special video interview with Roger McCoy. Today, Roger will speak about his family's experiences coming to Alberta from China and returning to Bangkok before they went to Kenmore, where we all got to know Roger and his family. May is Asian Heritage Month, and to mark this special month and learn a little more about Asian heritage in this part of the world, it's my pleasure to introduce Roger McCoy as my special guest via Zoom from Roger and Shelley's home on Salt Spring Island. Roger is no stranger to many of you, as he and Shelley and sons Christopher and Peter attended Ralph Connor United Church in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And welcome, Roger. It's really good to see you. Tell us a bit about your family history. I understand that the first uh, uh, Mapoy in your family uh, came to Canada uh, as, uh, and he was a teacher in China before he came to this country, just like you. Yes, that's correct. My my grandfather came in the late 1800s um, and then settled in uh, Pinoca, Alberta, which is uh, just north of Red Deer. Like like many uh, Chinese, uh, he had very limited English. My dad said that uh, his father literally got off the train and looked for land um, because he didn't have any way of like he had no horses or, or cattle or anything like that so he literally got off the train in, in Pinoca and um, looked for a place to begin he was a, a cook and had um, uh, a restaurant in Pinoca and that's how um, he established the family and we like many others uh, at that time period in the early 1900s um, grew our own uh, um, food uh, so um, chickens ducks geese sheep cattle um, and uh, a big garden and that's how uh, how he started his restaurant restaurant wow he was, he was very resourceful what sorts of hurdles did and challenges did uh, did your family face back then? Well, like uh, uh, many Chinese um, in that time period, uh, they came, came largely seeking for a better life. Um, and unfortunately, they, they ran into uh, both personal and institutional uh, racism. Uh, so uh, many people don't realize that um, there were uh, race riots in Vancouver and Calgary uh, in the early 1900s. Um, so they were subjected to a, a lot of racist um, uh, actions. And of course, with the head tax, um, the Canadian government tried to limit the amount of Chinese that were immigrating into Canada. And I have to think that that was um, done because uh, especially in British Columbia, in Victoria and Vancouver, in the 1880s, uh, the Chinese population um, was larger than the Caucasian population. So um, uh, for my family, it was a, a burden because my grandfather had come over by himself and then uh, sent for his wife back in China uh, and had to pay head tax. And um, it varied from the beginning at fifty dollars a person, um, and uh, ended at something like five hundred dollars a person uh, when people were making twenty five cents a day. So that's uh, a pretty dr dramatic sacrifice uh, for for a lot of the men that were trying to bring their their wives uh, from China. I understand that some of your relatives actually lived in the. Uh... Um, Bankhead area at one time. Did they, yeah. they ever talk about their experience there? Yeah. So my uh, aunties uh, were twins that were born in Bankhead. And um, <laughs> their comments were 
not um, I did not speak highly of Bankhead in terms of uh, basically it was apartheid. So uh, the the Chinese uh, took whatever labor jobs or whatever jobs they could do um, as a method of, of uh, employment. And in Bankhead in particular, the apartheid was so striking because um, in the Caucasian side of, of the town, uh, they had uh, running water and electricity. And on the China, Chinese side, at the end of literally at the end of the coal heap, um, they had none. Uh, so there was no running water, no electricity, and it was a, a pretty miserable life. Uh, so my uh, aunties said that they were sent back to China to uh, be educated, and they're about um, twelve, about uh, somewhere between twelve and fourteen years old, and. Um, when they were coming back to uh, uh, Canada from China, uh, they stopped in Hawaii and uh, they looked at each other and said, maybe we should just, you know, hop off here <laughs> in, in Hawaii and not come back <laughs> to uh, Bankhead because they knew life was pretty miserable. Yeah. But um, fortunately for me and uh, my uncles, uh, they uh, decided to come back and, they they did marry uh, one of my my uncles. As a denomination committed to intercultural work and confronting racism, Asian Heritage Month is a focal time to bring forward both the challenges faced by the people of Asian ancestry and their unique contributions to the United Church of ours. In that spirit of gratitude. We now present today's offer. Pray for those who live in poverty, 
who need a secure home base in order for other parts of their lives to really take hold. May all levels of government make adequate housing a priority. We pray for the landless people of this world, migrants and refugees, those who have had to leave to find a better life, and those who had absolutely no choice in the matter. Our prayers, as always, reach out to the Bati family and to Ahmed as they await progress in their refugee resettlement here. We pray for those displaced by fire and all whose anxieties are raised because of it and pray that other parts of the province will experience the clearer skies that we have enjoyed thus far this weekend. We pray for all who do not feel at home in their household setting, those who feel unsafe, those who feel ill at ease, and we include in this all who may not be able to live into their true sexual identity in their home place because they fear repercussions of doing so. And we pray for those who do not even feel at home with you, Holy One. Those who may feel a deep alienation in the present shape of their life. Be with those who feel lonely, isolated, out of place, and all who struggle with addiction. Reach through our hearts and the hearts of others to mobilize support and friendship and care. We pray, O oh God, for the yearnings of our hearts, especially if we do not feel at home or feel isolated or exiled from a preferred home. And we bring you our silent prayers for those closest to us, naming them and their needs to you, Holy One. These and all our prayers we bring to you in the name of Jesus, our companion, our heart's true home, and we continue together in prayer as we say, Beloved, in whom is heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, So that's May the 28th. 
Um, May 29th and 30th, um, I mentioned about the need to get things tidied up in Canmore. We will be having a, a cleaning meet, at least that's the plan. Uh, if you can help, please contact Bill Rowe. Bill, put your hand up at the back there, yeah. If uh, anyone uh, there, he's, he's even standing now, if you see the list of Bill. Just say it will be the 29th. We've had some volunteers for the 29th, so we'll make it that day. Okay, so just the one day? Yeah, and after you vote. Yes. <laughs> after everyone votes, good point, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, June the 4th, Sunday, June the 4th, will be a celebration of music Sunday. In Canmore, he says. <laughs> uh, if you have not yet submitted your list of five favorite hymns to Tanya, please do so today. There's a list of our uh, hymns we've used recently on the wall. There's half sheets of paper. You can just write down five of your favorites, put them in the box there, and we'll make sure those get into the, the list uh, as we make some decisions for hymns that are part of that. There's lots of other music happening in that service as well, but we realize that if we're going to have hymns, let's have ones that you've asked for. Um, on Friday, June the 16th, there is a concert here, the Kennedy Administration here at 730. Um, if you haven't heard these folks yet, this will be the best concert you're at all year, guaranteed. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, anything else that, that you wanted to say other than just like folks just come see you or email for tickets? Or, I have tickets and there's still lots of tickets left, so spread the word. Okay, yeah, spread the word, and I'll see if I can get some music clips or something up on the site and just give people a little, a little teaser okay. on what they're going to experience, because it's a good, good show. And one other announcement that I have, um, those of you who were here last Sunday, um, we've heard from Heather and Scott from Kansas, who were worshipping with us last Sunday and driving from Kansas to Alaska. And we're all wondering, how are you going to get there? <laughs> well, she says, uh, we regrouped because of the fires uh, and went over to Smithers and up the Cassiar Highway. Found it to be amazingly beautiful. Um, on Friday, they were in Whitehorse, hoping to be in Anchorage by today. And so, just wanted to touch base with us and appreciated our thoughts and prayers as uh, the two of them made that journey. Are there any other announcements to share this morning? Just reiterate the need for folks to sign up uh, on the worship clipboards. Uh, we're a bit shy on worship leaders in particular in coming weeks, um, so that would be great to have that attended to. Our heritage hymn this Sunday is Voices United 660, How Firm a Foundation.
commissioning and benediction, and at the end of that, the choir will come forward to lead us in a choral blessing, uh, which continues our honoring of Asian Heritage Month, uh, a sun blessing of Chinese origin. Um, they will sing it through once, and then we will sing it in a second time with them. So as we go forward, let us give thanks and glory to God. Glory to God, whose power and 